Hi everyone, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In psychology, there is a special term called Adelie syndrome, which refers to the morbid obsession of one person with another. The affliction received its name in honor of the youngest daughter of the famous French writer, Adelie Hugo. She was a very attractive girl and a talented pianist, but unrequited love noticeably affected her mental state. As a result, the beauty simply poisoned the life of herself and her lover, who for years pursued, pretending to be his wife, then ruined his career and personal life. Unfortunately, 43 years of her 84 years, Adele spent in the walls of a psychiatric hospital. It is worth noting that the condition in which one person is overly interested in, or even obsessed with, another so much, that he loses the ability to control his emotions, a fairly common phenomenon. In most cases, an experienced psychologist can help. Sometimes hospitalization and more thorough therapy are required, but sometimes such obsession borders on insanity, pushing a person to desperate, unpredictable, and extremely cruel actions. The case of Emma Youngstig in 2008 shook the whole of Europe and became one of the most brutal in the history of Swedish forensic science. The perpetrator could be recognized as insane, and because of the lack of hard evidence, the case and even wanted to close, but he showed his true face in the courtroom. An immature young family, Emma Youngstig, was a native of Stockholm, where she was born on February 16, 1985, where almost all of her childhood and adolescence passed. She was brought up in a simple family where she was the younger of two daughters and grew up with her older sister, Katharina. At the age of 19, the girl married a young man named Nicholas, with whom she began dating while still in high school. The chosen one was not much older than the girl, and at the time of marriage, the bride was already expecting a child. In 20 years, Emma first became a mother, giving birth to a son who was named Max, and a year and a half later, she gave birth to a second child, a daughter, Saga. But, despite the appearance of two common heirs, the couple were still too young and were not ready for family life and the hardships of everyday life. They constantly quarreled over trifles, could not find a common language, and soon after the birth of their daughter, decided that they should separate. But then, the question of custody of children, which was solved very hard and painful. Nicholas sought not only to help the children financially, but also to take a direct part in their lives and upbringing. Emma was not against it, but soon she had a new romantic relationship. She moved to a small town called Arbuga, located about 150 kilometers from Stockholm, to her new lover and took the children with her. The ex-husband was against it because he wanted to be able to see his daughter and son every day. Ex-spouses repeatedly met in court to settle the matter, and Nicholas even threatened Emma which she immediately reported to the police. Problems could not be solved peacefully in any way, and each of the parents began to seek sole custody. New love. Emma met a guy named Torgny Helberg through the internet. They quickly found a common language, got close, and a romantic relationship began between them. The young man was not confused by the fact that the 23-year-old girl already has two heirs from a previous marriage, because he had long dreamed of a family and was ready to accept them as his own children. The newly married couple first lived in a small house, which was inherited by Torni by inheritance. But when the lovers decided to get married, they moved to a larger house, where they could live comfortably and each of the children would have their own cozy room. The man at that time had a good job with a decent salary and Emma was engaged in raising small children as well as creating a home but, being a designer by education, was going to work in the future in the specialty. The couple planned to play a wedding in the summer of 2008, but these plans were not destined to fulfill. Brutal Massacre March 17, 2008 was an ordinary Monday. Torney went to work early in the morning and Emma stayed home with three-year-old Max and one-and-a-half-year-old Saga. In the evening, the girl was preparing dinner waiting for her fiancé to return, and at the same time, she was chatting online with her sister, Katarina, discussing a gift for their parents' upcoming wedding anniversary. At about half-past six in the evening, 
Emma received a call from Torney, warning her that he was late for work. He said they could start dinner without him. After the brief phone conversation, Emma continued with her household chores, fed the children, and then sat down at the computer again, continuing to text with her sister. At 07.07 p.m., their communication was abruptly interrupted literally half a word. Katarina thought it was very strange, because she saw that her sister was typing a message to her, but for some reason never sent it. Five minutes later, a worried Katarina called Emma, but she didn't pick up. Then she dialed Torgny's number to find out what had happened. The young man was on his way home from work and was just approaching the house, so he assured Katarina that everything was fine, that Emma was probably distracted by the kids, and that she would call her back as soon as she could. When the man arrived at the threshold, he was surprised to find that the front door was unlocked. When he went inside, he immediately noticed the mess, thinking that the children had made a mess while playing. But then he saw brown stains and stains on the floor, realizing with horror that it was blood. Helberg called Emma and the children's names loudly several times, but no one responded. In the hallway on the floor, the man saw a strange object, thinking at first that it was a doll, because the figure was lying in a completely unnatural pose. As he got closer, however, he realized that it was Saga in a pool of her own blood. Her head and face were disfigured beyond recognition and turned into a bloody mess. A little farther away lay her brother in a similarly horrifying state, with a fractured skull. Their mother was also lying on the floor, covered in blood and in an unnatural posture. Her face was badly shattered and disfigured. It seemed that all of them were no longer showing signs of life. Shocked, Tony pulled out his cell phone with trembling hands and dialed the emergency number, reporting what had happened. At that moment, Emma shuddered and let out a loud, long groan. Police officers and paramedics immediately arrived on the scene and found a weak pulse in all three victims and quickly began resuscitation. The picture was horrifying. No one understood what kind of beast could do this to a young woman and her children. But saving their lives was the priority. So, first of all, all efforts were thrown at getting the victims of the attack to the nearest hospital for assistance. Fighting for Lives and the Beginning of the Investigation from the outset, the arriving paramedics expressed doubts about whether the victims could be brought to the hospital alive at all. However, all three were still alive when they arrived at the medical facility. All were diagnosed with open head injuries, with severe brain damage and extensive blood loss. No prognosis was given by the doctors, but only did the best they could. Max and Saga were in critical condition. Even if they had managed to save their lives, it was unlikely that they would have ever been able to even breathe on their own. The condition of their mother was assessed as very serious, but stable. The young woman was put into a medically induced coma and hooked up to life support machines, hoping her body could cope. While doctors were fighting for the lives of the victims, forensic experts were working at the scene, trying to find clues and reconstruct the picture of the crime. Inside the house, chaos reigned. Scattered belongings, blood on the floor and walls. Unfortunately, the medics left behind a lot of clutter, as well as moving certain items around to allow access to the victims. The floor where Emma, Max, and Saga were lying was literally trampled on, and now the medics had to figure out what footprints belonged to them and if the perpetrator's prints were there. Remarkably, the intruder had massacred the three victims, at most in 13 minutes. Since the last message from Emma to her sister was sent at 07.07 p.m. and at 07.20 p.m. already received a call to the police from a frightened Torgny. That said, the brutality with which the perpetrator massacred them spoke of some personal motive and a deep dislike for the victims. The weapon of the crime was a blunt and heavy object, presumably a hammer, which the mysterious criminal used to bludgeon his victims with ferocity. However, nothing of the kind could not be found at the scene, from which the natural conclusion was that the perpetrator took it with him. First Suspect From the start, Helberg was the prime suspect. He was not married to Emma and was not the father of her children, 
and therefore it was suggested that perhaps a domestic quarrel between the couple could turn into a bloodbath. The grief-stricken man was immediately questioned, but he had an ironclad alibi. Firstly, he was really late at work, which was confirmed by his boss and colleagues. And secondly, at the time of the brutal massacre of his loved ones, he was walking down the street and was caught on a number of CCTV cameras. Nevertheless, Torney was decided to take a detailed statement, as he might have seen or heard something important that could help in the investigation of the crime. However, he could not remember anything specific, for it was business as usual until he saw the mess and the bodies lying on the floor. The only thing that alerted him was the unlocked front door, which could indicate that Emma had let the criminal in. After questioning, the man was released. By then, he had already informed his fiancée's family, and Emma's parents immediately rushed to Arbuga from Stockholm. Together, they went by car straight to the hospital to the victims, but on the way there, they learned from the news on the radio, terrible news. Max and Saga died of their injuries without regaining consciousness. Ex-husband's revenge? The new suspect was Emma's ex-husband and father of the children, Nicholas. The couple had been divorced for more than a year and parted peacefully they did not manage. They constantly quarreled, sued for custody of the children, and the man even threatened the ex-spouse, which she reported to the police. It seemed that everything fits. After the breakup of the young woman took the children and took them to another city to his new chosen one and their father, not having achieved custody through the court on the grounds of hostility to Emma, decided to take a desperate step and in a fit of rage and crucified the heirs. Nicholas was immediately tracked down and taken into custody, but the man seemed crushed by the news of Max and Saga's deaths, sobbing and constantly asking if there was some mistake. When he was charged with what had happened, he was at first stunned and then began shouting that he would never hurt his children, whom he adored. When asked where Nicholas was at the time of the crime, he replied that he was away in another city where he went on business for a day. It sounded strange, but soon his alibi was confirmed. The man was indeed 120 miles away from the crime scene when someone was massacring his ex-wife and children. Searching for clues and fearing for the life of the sole survivor. Forensic investigators remained active at the scene, trying to find any clues, evidence, or traces of the attacker. But the perpetrator had obviously worn gloves and left no fingerprints. With traces of shoes, everything was much more difficult, because the house was visited by a dozen doctors, who rendered assistance and took out the victims. Now it was necessary to collect all the footprints there, and to find out which of them did not belong to the medics, Torgny or the victims themselves. The law enforcers were afraid that the criminal, having learned that Emma had survived, might sneak into the hospital and finish what he had started. After all, she was a crucial witness, and in case she came to her senses and could testify, she would certainly give him away. Therefore, a 24-hour guard was posted outside Youngstig's room, at the same time, neighbors were interviewed in search of possible witnesses. One woman recalled that at around 05 was in the evening, a stranger in black clothes was walking around Emma and Torney's house. She thought it was strange, but she could not see the man's face because it was hidden by a hood. However, the neighbor suggested that it could be a girl because the figure was short and fragile. The same figure in black clothes and with a hood on his head also got into the lens of the street surveillance camera, located on the store a couple of minutes' walk from the scene of the crime. It also appeared to law enforcement that the woman in the video was a short, frail-looking girl. But who was she, and why would she wish harm on Emma and her children? The recording decided to show Torgny and to find out his opinion about who the stranger could be and whether he has any assumptions about it. Already from the first frames, the man began to change in his face, turned pale, and then said that it could be his ex-girlfriend, 31-year-old Christina Schurer, although he could not say for sure. Who is Christina Schurer? Torgny's former sweetheart was born in Hanover, Germany in 1977. When she was still a child, her father left the family and practically stopped communicating with his daughter, 
which negatively affected her mental state and behavior. The girl grew up willful and purposeful, but had a complex character. As a teenager, she went to the United States on an exchange program and lived in New York for several years. The girl received a good education in the field of history and archaeology, traveled extensively throughout Europe, taking part in excavations and expeditions. In the summer of 2006, she went to Greece, to the island of Crete, where she got a job in one of the popular hotels as a tour guide. There in July came on vacation 26-year-old Torgny, who immediately attracted Christina. He also liked this smart, interesting, and educated girl with whom he had an affair from the first days of acquaintance. Schurer at that time was 29 years old, but a small age difference did not embarrass the couple. Their connection lasted for a week while the guy was vacationing in the hotel, and after his departure they continued to communicate by phone and correspond on the internet. A few months later, Christina came to Helberg in Sweden and literally asked to stay at his house. Even then, such behavior seemed to Torni too intrusive and even tactless. So when Christina offered him a weekend trip to the mountains, he refused and sincerely hoped that this was the last time they would meet. But the girl continued to call, write, and insist on a new meeting. In January 2007, during a phone conversation, Torgny told Christina that everything was over between them and they should not meet again, but Christina pretended not to hear it. She continued to call, asking to come to visit him and calling Togni to go on vacation with her. In the spring of 2007, Christina again came to Sweden and began to literally stalk the former boyfriend. She persuaded him to resume their relationship although he honestly admitted that he is already dating another. Then Christina said that during the previous visit, forgot in his house something of the things, and she needs to take them away. Torgny agreed, but as soon as they crossed the threshold, the former lover tried to seduce him, and having received a firm refusal, said that he will still regret. Three months later, Christina returned again and began to apologize for her behavior, again persuading the guy to get together, but he rejected her, and in the evening she called, saying that she swallowed pills because she does not want to live without him. Helberg called her an ambulance and also called her family, telling them about Christina's antics and advising them to see a psychiatrist. After Schurer received the necessary care at the hospital, her mother took her away and placed her in a psychiatric hospital, where she spent more than a month. However, the treatment did not give much results, and the girl remained literally obsessed with her former lover, constantly thinking about how to get him back and inventing new reasons for meetings. In October 2007, Christina decided to move to Sweden and settled in the suburbs of Stockholm, where she rented an apartment with another girl. She started to pursue her ex-boyfriend again, and when she got to meet him, she told him that she had given birth to a son by him but gave the child to a foster family. Torney was shocked by this news, but what he was most interested in was when it had happened. The last time they had been intimate was more than a year ago, and after that, they had met three more times at different times, but Christine had shown no signs of pregnancy. She herself answered evasively, and each time added some new details. In January 2008, after a dozen unsuccessful attempts to meet with Torni, Christina wrote him a message in which she told him that their son had been diagnosed with a certain hereditary disease, and now they should go to Germany together to see him. She also added that the child's adoptive father would contact him and give him the details. At this time, she and Emma were in the process of moving to a new home, and the girlfriend was aware of the whole story. She believed that Tony's ex-girlfriend was simply trying to lure him to Germany, and no son had ever existed. When Tony received a call from a man who introduced himself as the adoptive father of her and Christine's child, Tony, on Emma's advice, began to ask questions about when the boy was born, in which hospital it happened, and so on. The interlocutor was clearly annoyed, avoided answering in every possible way, and then, and after all, hung up the phone. So Helberg finally came to the conclusion that no son never existed, 
Christine made up the whole story and asked someone from the acquaintances to play along. Christina's arrest and the search for evidence. After learning such a convoluted story, detectives quickly found out where the new suspect lived and went to the address. The door was opened by her roommate, who told them that Christina had hurriedly packed her things the day before and said that she was going back to Germany. A check showed that the girl had indeed left the country, so now the Swedish police had to seek help from their German colleagues to arrest her. On March 20th, a warrant was issued for her arrest. When the suspect was arrested, she claimed that there had been a mistake and that she had nothing to do with the massacre. But after she was taken to Sweden on March 29th, she immediately requested a meeting with Torni, which was denied. She was completely calm, but periodically asked to meet or call her ex again. Christina's rented apartment was thoroughly searched, and her phone and laptop were seized for inspection. All her clothes were thoroughly checked, but no traces of blood were found there. By then, investigators had worked out which of the bloody shoe prints at the scene did not belong to the medics and family members, so it was determined to be athletic. And from the tread pattern, they even figured out the brand and appearance. The size matched the one worn by the suspect, but she herself claimed that she never had such a model of sneakers. However, this statement was quickly refuted as the shoes were identified by her roommate. Much more interesting findings awaited detectives in Christina's laptop. It was full of photos of Torgny, both their joint, and those where the man was depicted alone or in the company of his new lover. Also, in a separate folder with a very unpleasant signature, contained pictures of Emma and her children, which the suspect copied from the rival's page in the social network. Schurer captioned each photo with insulting, threatening, and downright scary captions. In the recovered search history were found requests on how to commit a murder without leaving traces, how to hide traces of the crime, and how to divert suspicion from himself. Also in the notes, investigators found a plan of Emma and Torney's new home and notes that indicated when the man left for work and what time he returned, and some other notes regarding the family's daily routine. Interview with Survivor Emma's condition was stabilized, her vitals gradually began to improve, and towards the end of March, doctors decided to gradually bring her out of the medically induced coma. Upon awakening, she was still unable to speak because of the breathing tube, but her gaze was meaningful. It was clear that she recognized the relatives present in the room, but did not understand what had happened to her and how she had ended up in the hospital. As soon as the victim became a little stronger and was able to speak clearly, the police agreed to talk to her, but decided not to tell her what had happened to the children. And then it turned out that Emma had no memory of the events of that fateful day and believed that she must have been in a car accident. She kept asking about the children and whether they were all right. At first, she was given evasive answers, but then her family and medical team decided that there was no point in withholding such information. When Emma was told about what had happened and that her babies were no longer alive, she became hysterical. The doctors had to sedate her, after which she fell asleep, and when she woke up, she did not remember the conversation and asked about the children again. This continued for several weeks, and during this time, the mother was told several times about the death of her daughter and son, but her brain apparently refused to accept this information, each time erasing it. After another month, Emma, accompanied by medics, decided to be brought to the scene. Once inside the house, she suddenly remembered everything. The young woman told how she was texting with her sister, setting the table, and the children were playing near her when there was a knock on the door. She opened the door and saw a dark, short female figure on the threshold, but when she asked what she wanted, she felt a sharp pain and her eyes went black. The figure skulked into the house, and the desperate mother, out of her last strength, tried to catch up with her to protect her children, but apparently fell in the hallway, where they tried to finish her off. The trial and the verdict. Christina continued to stubbornly deny her guilt, the weapon of the crime was never found, and almost all the evidence found was circumstantial, which gave her a high chance of getting away with it. However, Christina's roommate, when questioned, 
said that in March a hammer was missing from her toolkit. She produced the toolkit itself, and the investigation determined that the size and configuration of that brand of tool matched the murder weapon. But that evidence was also circumstantial. Detectives were able to find surveillance footage from a suburban bus station, where Schurer had traveled three times in the week before the crime. She herself could not explain why she visited Arbuga so often, but apparently the girl came to keep an eye on her future victims. The suspect was also unable to explain why she was searching the internet for information on how to cover up the crime and why she was collecting photos of Emma and her children. On July 29, 2008, the trial over Christina, who was accused of double murder with particular cruelty as well as attempted murder, began. The defendant herself behaved more than strangely. Upon entering the courtroom, she smiled and began to wave her hand, greeting those present. When she was asked questions about the massacre and was shown gruesome footage of the crime scene with mutilated bodies, she suddenly laughed. This suggested that the defendant was insane, but the appointed psychiatric examination established that the girl was sane and perfectly aware of what was happening. Consequently, she enjoyed what she had done and did not even try to hide it. When Emma was in the courtroom and saw Christina there, she fainted. When she was brought to her senses, she said that she finally remembered everything and this face was the last thing she saw on that fateful day. Despite the defense lawyer's attempts to prove her client's innocence, the jury unanimously found her guilty on all counts. Christina was sentenced to life in prison with no right to ever be released. She was also ordered to pay 20,000 euros in compensation to Emma. No evidence was found that Christina had ever been pregnant and had given birth to a son by Torgny. As for Youngstig, her recovery process was long and arduous, but Togni did not abandon his beloved. They were married in the summer of 2010. The couple are now raising two common heirs who know the sad story of their older brother and sister. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.